Okay, welcome. My name is Jackie Jacob. I am uh, one of two poultry specialists here at the University of Kentucky. Um, I am responsible uh, for the small and backyard community of practice on e-extension, which is the electronic version of the National Cooperative Extension Service here in the United States. Um, as that, we do do uh, monthly webinars. We've been doing them for several years now. All our webinars are recorded and the recording chat is disabled. Why is chat disabled? I see your messages. Attendee can chat with everyone. I hope that helps. Let me uh, put type in the chat box something so I can see that the chat is working. As far as I know, uh, okay. As far as I know, it's never had it disabled it before. So I don't know why that happened. Anyway, thank you very much for letting me know that it, it was not working. Um, so as I say, we do do the monthly webinars. Um, we have different speakers, uh, different times, uh, everything is recorded and the uh, recording is available uh, online. Um, I will um, show you uh, where that is at the end. Um, but uh, today, not only am I the host, I am also the, um, the speaker. So, um, Hopefully everybody can see my presentation here. Introduction to poultry genetics is what the topic is. Uh, if you cannot see it, please let me know. Um, I only have one screen, so um, it's hard uh, to be the uh, moderator and the speaker at the same time. So um, we will be talking today on an introduction to poultry genetics. Uh, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail on, on some things. Um, and I think one of the things that I want you to learn is that you can't just email somebody and say, I crossed this chicken with that chicken, what, what am I gonna get? Because unless you've kept good genetic records of the chickens that are being crossed, you won't know. So we'll go over uh, the basics. Um, so um, starting very basic, everything that happens in each cell of a living organism, whether that's plants or animals, is directed by DNA. And DNA makes RNA, which makes proteins. And it's the proteins that dictate what happens in the body or the plant, um, and that's all uh, through the DNA in the genes of the, the genetic material of the individual. So in the embryo, then these proteins will um, direct the development of organs. They will affect the development of limbs and other body parts. So the outward expression of the genetics will be the appearance of the organism once it has gone through the whole embryonic stages. In the adults, of course, proteins serve many things with uh, digestive enzymes, antibodies for the immune system. Muscles, of course, are proteins. Uh, regulation of the expression of DNA and RNA itself is uh, a function of protein. Um, hormones are proteins. Molecules moving around the body are all hormones, are all proteins. So proteins are key and the key proteins are determined by DNA. So the basics of heredity is DNA in the nucleus of each cell. The nucleus has chromosomes which transmit genetic material from one generation to the another, and they typically come in pairs. 
A gene is a segment of DNA that is the basic unit of hereditary. So a gene will determine, for example, feather color, comb type. And again, they come in pairs, one from the mother and one from the father. DNA and RNA are made up of nucleic acids. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, whereas RNA is ribonucleic acid. They have different nucleic acids in them and which um, that is the building blocks that are used to determine the uh, proteins that you're gonna get um, when they are transcribed. And occasionally errors do occur in the replication of the DNA, and this will change the nature of the protein that results. So that's what's referred to as a mutation, and it is the mutation that leads to the diversity of phenotypes, which is the outward expression of the genotype or the genetics that we see. Um, and there is crossover, so different things that can be linked from one to another can happen as the um, cells become uh, sperm in order for um, reproduction to take place. So in addition to uh, the function of genes to make uh, proteins, they also have to be regulated. So they have uh, portions of them. Part of it is the promoter sequence, which turns on the gene, the template sequence, which creates the protein, and the termination sequence, which tells it to turn off. So as an example, um, this one here, the transcript's going to be blocked unless the, um, the RNA polymerase is on there to allow the transit transition, uh, transcription to occur. So you have the promoter sequence that has to be activated before you can get the protein created. And then once you've created it, you need to stop the gene from making it. Alleles are a term that refers to different versions of a gene of a chromosome that on a chromosome that is determined uh, a specific characteristic. So um, alleles, genes, they often get uh, interaction, but I mean, uh, inter-exchanged, um, but alleles are just forms of genes and genes are positioned on the uh, a chromosome at loci. And genes on the same chromosome are said to be linked. So usually you inherit them together. So uh, this is, for example, uh, chromosome 20, and it um, shows you that those particular uh, proteins are linked together so that if you get one, you get the other. But as I talked about earlier, you can get crossover between chromosomes and the amount of crossover depends on how far apart the genes are. The closer they are, the less likely they are to cross over onto a different gene, different chromosome. So this just shows some of the uh, chromosomal crossovers that can occur uh, between two different chromosomes. So if we reflect, um, most people are familiar with the human genome. We have sex chromosomes that contain genes that determine the sex of the individual. So a female is XX and a male is XY. And of course, with different mutations, you can have XXX or XXY or whatever, depending on some other things. But typically, females are XX and males are XY. Autosomal chromosomes are those that do not determine the sex of the individual. And humans have 22 pairs of these. So in total, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. One pair determines whether you're male or female, and the other does the other characteristics of blue eyes, blonde, whatever, um, of the, the determined in your genetic profile. Chickens uh, are similar. 
They have um, sex chromosomes as well. They are not XY, they are Z and W. But while the male is heterozygous, meaning it has one of each, so it can donate sperm of X or Y in uh, chickens and all birds. Um, the male is ZZ, so the only chromosome it can uh, contribute to the offspring is a Z. The female is the heterozygous, so the female is ZW, and the female, therefore, genetically speaking, determines the offspring of the, the, the sex of the offspring, so totally reversed from mammals, including humans. And then Chickens have 38 pairs of autosomal chromosomes, which are those that are not related uh, to sex determination. Of those 38 pairs, five are considered macro chromosomes, meaning they're, you know, they're really large. They have 28 micro chromosomes, which are really small. They also have the highest rate of recomb recombination by crossover. And although they are the smallest, they have the highest density of genes. And then there's five intermediate uh, chromosomes in there with regards to size. Homozygous is a word that I've used, and that means that the alleles are, are the same uh, from both parents. So you can see there in the picture on the left, it had they've got you know BB. Uh, from it or you know either the recessive or negative heterozygous is one of each um, and so how these two alleles from the two different parents that's the genotype and how they interact becomes the phenotype so what they outwardly see and so as I said, genotype is the set of genes responsible for a particular trait and phenotype is the observable characteristics. Um, and Mendel is a, a monk uh, that started a lot of the genetics and came up with a lot of our genetic understanding, genetic principles. And so um, things are re often referred to as Mendelian genetics. And he worked with flowers. Um, and so he found that um, it had two alleles. And if you have the two capital dominant um, alleles, then you get purple. If you get one of each, so you have the dominant and the recessive, the dominant covers up the recessive. And so you also have purple. And if you have two small ones, uh, which it's hard to see in that photograph, but when it says homozygous at the bottom, those are two lowercase p's, the two recessives, and that results in white. So the interaction between the two alleles uh, is what comes up with the phenotype that you see. Uh, Mendelian genetics have several principles. The law of segregation says every parent's pair of genes or alleles divide and a single gene passes from every parent to an offspring and which particular gene passes on in a pair is entirely up to chance. So the chromosome number is halved in the gametes. Parents only pass on one allele of their pair. Um, so they're passing on 50% of their gene the progeny receives one from each parent to get uh, back to the, the two chromosomes. And of course, recombination occurs, can result in different combinations of alleles. The law of independent assortment says that discrete pairs of alleles pass onto the offspring without depending on one another. So, uh, genes in a particular region of a genome does not affect the inheritance of genes of unli unlinked genes in a different region. Uh, law of dominance, recessive alleles are always masked by the dominant ones. Makes sense, you know, dominant over recessive. So if you have uh, a dominant gene, you don't really um, 
express the recessive of the other. You only see the recessive if both of them are present on the chromosome. So if we have a female that has two dominant um, genes, which we're just calling A, and a male which has two recessive of it and you cross them together, all the offspring have one of each, but the dominant uh, gene from the female is going to be the characteristic that the offspring will uh, show. But if you then cross you know, the female with that one of each, with the male from one of each, you're gonna get some that have both of the, the dominant genes. You're gonna have a pair that have one of each and you're gonna have one with recessive. So cr when you start crossing, if you don't know if you're homozygous or uh, heterozygous, um, then you can't really tell what the offspring are going to be. Then to complicate things, we have incomplete dominance and that's the allele show, uh, but is stronger in a purebred than in a mixed. So uh, one of these examples is one type of blue color, which is designated as BL. If they have um, one of each, one dominant, one recessive, it comes out blue. But if they have both, then they get uh, white with specks. Whereas if it's recessive, they get black. So um, it's one of those um, incomplete dominance and it's only one of the genes for blue. There are others. So don't think, well, just because you've, you know, you've crossed something that was blue, you got a different result. Um, that's because um, there are different genes that do blue plumage. Um, so this one here is a, an osterlope, for example, black osterlope is uh, recessive for the two, the BL. Um, and then if you have the dominant one, you get the white with, with uh, the specks and then the one of each, they get blue. So when you're crossing um, a blue male with a blue female, you don't get them all blue. You get some white with specks, some blue and some black. Um, and another example of co-dominance co is when both alleles are expressed. And um, I couldn't find one in poultry, but basically the AB blood types in humans is one of those that shows co-dominance so that you could have uh, if you have a parent that's A and one that's B, you end up with AB. Then you get interaction between alleles at uh, one locus, which we talked about with the dominant, recessive, co-dominant, and incomplete dominance. But you also get interaction between alleles at different loci, and that can re result in what's called an epistatic event effect, where one allele on a chromosome is affecting another. So one of these uh, examples of epistasis is uh, where some genes overrule the effects of other genes. So comb type, you have R for rows and P for P comb. So if you have the dominant R uh, for rows and the recessive for the P, then you get a rose cone. If you have the reverse, where you have the recessive for the rose and the dominant for the P, you have a P cone. But if you have dominant for both, you end up with a walnut cone. And if you have the recessive for both, you have a single cone. So that's where one gene is affecting another gene. And so if you're crossing the rose comb female with the pico male, you can see that 100% of the offspring are going to be walnut comb. Assuming of course that your rose comb is a homozygous for the dominant R and your P comb is homozygous for the dominant P. If it has one of each, that's not what happens. So if you look at crossing a walnut female and a walnut male from that particular, um, from that particular cross where you're getting one of each, okay, 
you end up with one single comb uh, in, is a ratio. You get three out of 16 are gonna have P comb, three out of 16 are gonna have rose comb, and nine out of 16 are gonna have walnut comb. So um, you get that interaction between different um, genes on the same chromosome. There are then other genes that can affect that. So the duplex comb, uh, which is the, the D gene, there are three possible versions of the D gene. D plus is the wild type, which means what's normal, and that is no duplex. You can get a V-shaped, which is a doubling of the comb with suppression of tissue mass. And the result is the uh, two spikes that you see. And then you can get the um, buttercup uh, version, which is a doubling of the chromosome only. And then you end up with the uh, buttercup type of comb. The D with the V-shaped is also associated with larger nostrils. So there's another gene that it's interacting with. There are also, in some breeds, there's also linkages with polydactyly where they have a fifth toe. And for some uh, breeds, there is also linkage with multiple spurs. And the three B breeds with buttercup combs are the Sicilian buttercup that most know, the La, La Camant and the Augsburger, which are more common in Europe than they, they are in the United States also have the, uh, that gene and have a type of buttercup comb. So uh, that is the Le Camant and that is the Augsburger. And then there's the cushion comb, which is a modification of the walnut comb. So other uh, genes have come into play to uh, affect the, the phenotype from the uh, walnut comb. And those are the Chanticleer, which is a Canadian breed, um, which was developed from Cornish, Leghorn, and Wyandotte breeds. And the Orloff, which is a Russian breed. The strawberry comb, again, is another modification of the walnut comb. So it has those genes, and then it has other genes that affect it. And those are the Malay and the Yokohamas. The carnation comb was the most recent one to um, be developed. It's basically a single comb with some spikes at the end. And there are two breeds that have the carnation comb. They're, they are uh, quite rare, but it is the, the, the new version of the comb that they have. And then there is the bread of chicken that has no comb at all. So uh, there are different gene mutations that can affect combs. There's a lot of different genes involved in what's going to happen with the comb. So you can't just say, I have this chicken that I'm looking at that has a rose comb, and I'm looking at this chicken that has a walnut comb. I don't know anything else about them. I'm going to cross them together. and I can't tell you what's going to be. I can, we can try and figure out the genetics based on what hatches out, but um, without knowing the genetic background of the birds involved, there's no way to, to predict what's going to happen. Crest is another one. Um, feather crested head is another term for it. It is an autosomal incompletely dominant. Uh, and it resulted from the misexpression of five closely linked genes. And so for the crested Polish and silky, it's the uh, HOXC10 gene that was affected um, with the, the uh, Appenzelder Spitzen Holbein breed, it's the HOXC8. So uh, you can get different versions of the crested gene and they will result in slightly diff different crests. Muffs and beards is something that we also see. 
Uh, and again, it's a single locus that is incompletely dominant, and that involves the expression of the HOXB8 gene. So um, they have uh, plotted out a lot of the um, the gene genome of the chicken and it can figure out which genes do what and can result in what, what phenotype. Ear tufts, which is mostly common in the Aracana breed, um, is an also an autosomal incompletely dominant one. Research has also shown that it's a lethal condition. Uh, some embryos die during the 17 to 19 days of, of incubation. And if it has the homozygous for the dominant, then you usually get about 100% mortality of that, of the ones with that. If it has one of each, it's usually about 20% mortality. So if you look at crossing uh, tufted with the heterozygous for both, because if you have the homozygous, it's going to die. So this, this uh, offspring can't happen. Um, it will die as an embryo. And then um, a quarter of them will have um, no ear tufts. And then half of them will have the heterozygous uh, and only 20 and only 80% of those are likely to hatch. So breeding ear tufts can be difficult because of the hatchability problem. Earlobe cover, cover, oh. earlobe color uh, is mostly red and white that we uh, think about. Um, white is due to a purine base deposition, whereas red is due to a mixture of different pigments being in. And there is a wide variation in the color. And it, a lot of it has to do with the ancestral linkages and mutations that have, have occurred. Uh, and variation in earlobe color can also be due to adaptability to local conditions. So the environment can affect it as well as the genetics. Uh, purple chromosomes, um, blue, purple, and black uh, earlobes can also be found in some breeds, and that's going to be a mutation or a different line of birds. Uh, it's very multifactorial. Um, it is believed to be sex linked for at least some breeds. So it, it can be on the Z um, chromosome and polygenetic, polygenic, which means it's involving a lot of genes. So there's more than 18 genes that they know of that can affect earlobe color. Uh, most chickens have four toes, three in the front and one in the back but there are um, some mutations that can result in five toes. So the Beijing fatty and the silky have five toes. It's an autosomal dominant. So as long as you have that one dominant, you'll have an additional uh, digit on one or both feet. And for some, you can also get it on the wings. Uh, and it's a defect in the regulation of what they call the sonic hedgehog gene. Uh, and it um, controls the number and identity of the, um, controls the number of digits based on, <coughs> excuse me, on the expression of that chromosome. And it's a protein that meteorates some of the things that are happening during embryonic development. So you can see the different variations of where that toe can appear. Uh, WT, which is the A, is wild type, which is the normal, uh, which is the four digits. And then you start getting silky that are coming out from uh, somewhere else. And um, so it all, there are different uh, versions of it depending on interaction with other genes. Um, Preaxial polydactyl uh, five toes can happen from other reasons as well. Uh, it's a defect in the Dorkings um, 
And it's again, some uh, improper expression of several genes when the embryo is developing. One of course being the sonic hedgehog that I already talked about and one being the fibroblast growth factor four. And so they're going to affect the development of the, um, the embryo and result in a, a fifth toe. Uh, Houdans also have a fifth toe and uh, it can again be a separation from a different uh, gene background than some of the others. Feathered shanks can be up to three different genes involved, three different loci, uh, dominant at uh, two of the loci and recessive at a third. So depending on the different combinations that you have of those uh, loci, you're gonna get uh, different results in the amount uh, and uh, presence and amount of the feathers on the shanks. Skin color, skin pigment is related to uh, either the carotenoids, which give yellow, or the melanin, which gives black. So the three typical skin colors that you see are white, yellow, and black. Uh, yellow is determined at the W locus, uh, which inhibits epidermal cyanophyll pigmentation and is completely dominant to the recessive form. Uh, it is believed to have originated from the gray jungle fowl. All the different breeds that we have today are believed to have originated from the jungle fowl, mostly the red jungle fowl, but there are other types of jungle fowl that probably contributed genes to the modern breeds as well. Uh, and this gene is expressed in the liver, not in the skin, so the pigment would have been uh, developed in the liver. Instead, it's not, and so it doesn't end up in the skin. Um, so the dominant form is white. The recessive form would be yellow. So uh, one of them is the, the leghorn. White skin, again, is the W. It is the recessive form of that that results in the uh, white skin chickens. And black skin is a hyperpigmentation with the FM. So there's some breeds in China that specifically have it. Um, they don't necessarily show as a, a medallion trait. It tends to be uh, more of a, a broad spectrum that it does. So some lines still continue to produce lighter colored or white skinned uh, birds. And, while others with the, you know, the same genetics seem to appear um, to produce the darker color. Uh, it's this one particular gene, the agouti signaling protein gene that affects the role of melanin synthesis. So you get a T allele, T allele which is associated with black skin and a C allele, which is associated with white skin. And that gene interacts with the MC one R gene, which affects skin color. So some of the breeds, you get the silky, the yami samani, the black mung, and the, I don't know how to say that, svarthona, svarthona. Um, and of course it's dominant over the, the white, uh, and it goes all the way through. It's not just the skin, um, you can see that the bones, the organs, everything uh, is, is basically uh, black. Um, there are other mutations that can be involved. So depending on uh, you know, the background, the genetic background of the birds, you could have different genes uh, affecting the skin color as well. Uh, so polygenic inheritance, which I already mentioned for uh, some of the other traits, is uh, a characteristic which is controlled by multiple genes. So it's not just one gene that determines it. It's not a simple cross this with that and you get, you know, uh, X, Y, give you Z. Multiple genes are involved. Um, shank colors, one. 
uh, colors vary from black to blue, green, yellow, or white. Um, and then they have the dermal melanin, uh, the extended black, the yellow legs, and other regulatory genes, including sex link barring can be involved, the dominant white and the recessive allele at the sex link uh, yellow skin loci, loci. So there's a lot of different genes that are involved in determining shank color. Uh, and then you can even get some um, breeds that have uh, green shanks. Uh, it's considered a defect. It's a Z-linked recessive gene. Remember, Z is one of the um, one of the sex chromosomes, and it's due to an interaction between uh, different genes. Other ones that do cause green spots, like the Ancona is another gene that, uh, another version of a gene that can occur uh, on the chromosomes. So uh, several different websites have put together, you know, what combinations are needed to get uh, a black shank with white soles, white shank, shanks and feet, black shanks with white soles, blue shanks with white soles, near black with yellow soles, all of these different combinations, you can see that three different genes are involved um, and there's different versions of the genes. So again, it's not a simple thing to cross two chickens together if you do not know the genetic background. One of the newest mutations that they've come up with was in the New Hampshire gene and it's the scaleless. Uh, and so you end up with chickens with um, no feathers. I think some of you might have seen it in the um, news one time. They thought it would make it easier. You wouldn't have to pluck the chicken, but um, it is really um, red chicken. So I don't know that it would ever go over well, but it, it is an autosomal recessive of the New Hampshire breed of chicken. The naked neck is another one, has no feathers on the back. Um, some consider it a breed, the Transylvania naked neck, uh, autosomal dominant gene, which can be incorporated into other breeds. So you are starting to see naked neck um, versions of um, chickens from different breeds. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, vulture hawks, for most breeds, it's considered a defect. Uh, feathers in the cruel feather tract of the tibia are increased in length and rigidity, taking on the appearance of a flight feather. And so it's an autosomal recessive type of gene. Um, so it only shows up when you have both of them. Um, so this just shows you which uh, feathers are messed up to make it look like that. The preen gland, which is what they use to get the oil to, um, to preen. Um, there is another uh, defect, another mutation that can result in a double uropygeal gland. So it has two of them uh, linked together instead of one. Um, there are some uh, genes that are, are linked to one of the uh, sex chromosomes, the Z chromosome, and they have been used in uh, doing uh, feather sexing of different types of birds. Some have used it for chickens, some have used it for turkeys. It depends on whether or not that gene exists in a particular breed that you're working with but they were using it for a while with broilers. Uh, and if it has the dominant K, then it's slow feathering. If it has the recessive form, it's fast feathering. And so if you cross a slow feathering female, which will have the dominant um, gene on her Z chromosome and nothing on her W chromosome, and you cross her with a male that is fast feathering, which means it has both recessive forms of it, then all the males are gonna be slow feathering and all the females 
that hatch out are going to be fast feathering. And so they were using that for a while commercially to feather sex day old chicks when they used to raise male and female broilers separately. For most strains now, they don't uh, raise them separately. And so you can see that the pullet with the fast feathering is, is uh, got, it's easier to tell the males from the females. That's that day of hatch. Afterwards, uh, not so much. Uh, some breeds have developed that have long tails. Um, the genetics is not completely known, but they do know that there is at least one uh, dominant allele and one recessive allele that are involved. The GT allele is for non-limit of growth, so it basically doesn't stop it. It just keeps growing. And the MT is for no molt, so it keeps growing and it doesn't molt, so you end up with a really long tail. Um, and so there's also the no tail. So the Aricana has is rumpless. It has no tail. It does not have the bones for the tail to be on it. And that is a particular mutation that they uh, have listed as RP. Then there is uh, some strange things that happen with uh, Hen feathering in which the males have the plumage of the females. Seabright bantams are one example of that. So that the male on the left uh, has the exact same plumage pattern and feather types as the uh, one on the right, the female on the right. And that is uh, related to another gene, the HF or hen feather gene. If they have the, at least one of the dominant uh, hen feathering gene, then the, the males will feather out hen feathered. If they, they are both lowercase, then they will have normal feathering. Uh, females can carry the hen feathering, but of course uh, they're hen feathered anyway, so you wouldn't necessarily know that it had it. And what happens is that um, hen feathering, whether or not it's pointed or rounded tipped or whether they're sickle feathers or not, whether, whether they're saddle feathers or cushion feathers depends on estrogen and the skin of the chickens can have increased levels of, of estrogen uh, because the, uh, they have an increased level of the enzyme aromatase, which converts testosterone, which is the male hormone to the female, which is the estrogen. And so the uh, feather follicles have extra estrogen in it and the feathers uh, appear hen female-like instead of male-like. The frizzle is another one that it was a breed for itself, but now they have realized which genes are involved and they've incorporated the genes as a variety in some different breeds. Um, and this is uh, basically an F gene on chromosome 33, incomplete dominance. So uh, if it has both, it's more curled than if it has only one. So, um, Again, another mutation that was changed into a breed. Um, and of course, you have to know whether or not you have it in there uh, to see it. So uh, the silky or hookless gene is another one. Uh, so instead of curling it, it basically uh, has more fluff to it. So that is the um, comparing a normal and a, a silky type chicken, silky type uh, of feathering. Then, of course, the, uh, we have been talking about qualitative genetics, which in which traits fit into distinct categories, you know, uh, rose comb versus pea comb, uh, that side of sort of thing. So comb type feathers on the shanks. And those are usually a single gene or a group of genes. Then there is quantitative genetics, which is what they use more for commercial type of production where they are trying to select for a production trait. And so these are, are phenotypes that depend on many different genes as well as the environment so that the trait varies considerably among individuals. And so you get this continuous 
distribution of different types of phenotypes. So you, you know, these can be body weights, uh, the height of the birds, uh, egg production, those types of things. So selecting for egg production involves selecting for many different genes. So it's more of a quantitative genetics and not a qualitative genetics. So those are two totally different types of breeding programs. Qualitative genetics is more for backyard flocks, uh, purebred breeders trying to come up with different phenotypes, different varieties of breeds, that sort of thing. Whereas the quantitative genetics is more the production characteristics and so is more used with uh, commercial production systems. And if you are looking through, you know, reading about different types of um, production or different types of breeding, different uh, notations that you'll see. P represents parental generation. F1 is the generation from that parental cross. F2 is the cross uh, from that F1 generation. And if you see the plus sign, that usually means the, the wild type in that it existed in the wild red jungle fowl. And uh, as I said earlier, the, the uh, different domesticated chicken breeds that we have come from the red jungle fowl of Southeast Asia. And based on you know, mitochondrial DNA of all the different breeds, they come from the same genetic origin, whether they are bantam sized, whether they're feathering dark red for males and brown for females. The females lay one clutch of eggs a year. The males exhibit aggressive behavior and they have an eclipse molds where they look more like a female than a male. So all of that is common in the red jungle fowl and can have an effect on the breeds of chickens uh, that we produce. Uh, chickens were originally a sacrificial animal uh, and then cockfighting became more uh, responsible for the spread of a chicken. So food pr uh, production was actually the third reason that they started using it. But um, originally it, it was a religious thing, spiritual thing with sacrificial animal, then cockfighting. And as they were selecting for good cockfighting birds, that would affect body size and conformation, the uh, molting period, the comb size, all the different things that they would select to have a good cockfighter is going to also affect other parameters. And that resulted in the range of birds that we started to see. And you ended up with many, many, many different types of poultry breeds that we have out there. We have our American standard of perfection, there's an Australian standard of perfection, there's a British one, there's a European one. So there are many different breeds that are popular in different areas. So the red jungle fowl has that distinct coloring there, the white earlobe, the single comb and wattles. So that would be the, um, the wild type, but there are other types of jungle fowl that I referred to earlier. They have a slightly different plumage uh, coloring. They have red shanks, they have red earlobes, they still are single comb. Uh, the Sri Lanka jungle fowl, again, another type of plumage. They have pink shanks, they have red earlobes, they have a modified single comb and they have a different eye color. So you're seeing different genes are coming in because there was different crossing between the different types of jungle fowl. The green jungle fowl, again, a different plumage pattern. They have gray shanks. They have very small red earlobes. They have a modified wattle in the front instead of the two on the side and their uh, modified single comb is different as well. So you can see the different types of jungle fowl that exist and may have played a, a role uh, contributing to the gene pool that is available when we started selecting from the red jungle fowl. 
And then we ended up with all the different types. I mean, this is just some of them. It shows you how you start with one type of breed, you select for something and develop another breed, and then you select from that one and you get different ones and then you cross them over and you do all sorts of things. So um, all the different genes that get moved around in the, the, the breeding process is going to result in um, quite a large gene pool out there, depending on what breed you have. So um, there, the development of new breeds or new varieties within a breed, um, sometimes it's selection for existing traits. So changing the size of the birds, changing the production of the birds, changing the carriage, how the bird stands, changing the comb, whether it has multiple spurs or just one spur, the plumage pattern, um, so as you're breeding, different mutations or gene insertions can occur. Um, I used to work in a quail uh, genetics facility and, you know, we crossed lots and lots of birds and every once in a while a mutation would appear and then you would try and reproduce that one um, so that you could study that particular mutation, which gene was affected. Um, that's long before they did the, the um, genome where they map the entire genome of the, the birds. But um, mutations are usually what results in, in different characteristics being introduced into a variety or breed. Just as I said with the frizzle where you're getting that uh, mutation going on um, and some traits can be caused by more than one type of mutation. So they have different heritability. So uh, although they may have the same phenotype, different genotypes may be involved. Uh, dwarfism, for example, can be autosomal, uh, like bantam leghorns. It's the AW, uh, ADW gene, which results in reduced body weight with short state stature despite normal hormonal growth concentrations. Um, so it's basically about 30 to 40% reduced adult body weight. So it's bantams were originally uh, dwarfism, but there is also a sex link dwarfism that's on the Z chromosome. Um, some have used it with broider breeders so that you have um, a smaller bird. Um, so it takes up less space, eats less food, um, but can produce a normal sized uh, broiler uh, that you can hatch out when you made it with normal males. If you made an autosomal dwarf male with a sex link dwarf, all the progeny are normal size and can yield good uh, fertility. So um, there's a lot of things going on there. Then you, as I said, you could get some virus insertion of genes that can occur. Uh, some happened many, many, many generations ago. So the blue shelled eggs of the Araucana chicken, for example, uh, they're found in South America. And then these two breeds that were find, found in China, they developed separately. And the uh, ancient gene uh, for the blue shell was originally inserted into the chicken genome by a retrovirus. So the bird basically got sick with a retrovirus and the gene was inserted into their genome and they started laying blue shelled eggs. That does not mean eating, you know, Aricana eggs is going to make you sick. The chicken is perfectly healthy. It just had a change in its genome many hundreds of years ago. And now that gene exists and can be introduced into other breeds as well. Uh, and some of the things they used to do a long time ago and not so much now, you can get new feather colors and patterns uh, by irradiating the sperm, basically putting the, the radiation onto the sperm to try and cause mutations in the sperm and then use those sperms uh, to mate with the females and see what you get. But that's a hit or miss thing. You can't really control what is happening with that. So that is what I have. I hope um, that gives you a basic understanding of uh, 
the complexity involved in genetics, it's not, you know, as easy as, as it sometimes looks. You have to keep good detailed records of the breeding profile of the birds that you have in order to be able to uh, figure out which ones you want to cross to try and get what uh, offspring. There are many different types of websites that do have, um, you know, they've been collecting data on um, the different genes involved in, in things so that you can, uh, you know, if you look for, for different genetics, it might give you the genetic profile of different um, varieties of um, or different breeds of chickens as to what the uh, expected um, genotype is. So uh, this is the list of uh, webinars, upcoming webinars. Next month's webinar is on um, breeding programs. So having a basic understanding now of what the, you know, how genes work and interact and how complex it is. Um, next month, we will be talking about developing a breeding program, whether that is to perfect a, a breed or variety that already exists in the standard of perfection. How do you select the right birds to uh, carry on for the next generation, uh, or whether you are trying to develop a new variety or a new breed or something like that. Um, different breeding programs are involved. If you are doing a breeding program for egg production or meat production, again, that's going to be um, qualitative genetics. And so that's a different breeding program as well. So uh, next month's webinar, which is September the 6th at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, will be pure breeding purebred poultry. So it's more the purebreds than the um, production. Um, and then October is litter management for home flocks. Uh, November 1st, is making your own feed and December 6th is an overview of chicken anatomy. So we have a variety coming up. If you have a topic that you are interested in and uh, cannot find a recording of it having been covered in the past, or if we're not planning for it, all you have to do is email me and I will try and um, get one organized. We're always looking for ideas for, for topics. So um, so it's almost four o'clock. Uh, does anybody have any questions? It's a lot to take in. Um, as I said, it's, poultry is, uh, genetics is not as easy as it sounds with you know, dominant, recessive, you're getting interaction between genes, you're getting interactions uh, between chromosomes, you're getting all sorts of things uh, going on. So. so not seeing any questions, I'm going to stop the recording.